The mysterious murder of Sharon Tate and her companions on August 8, 1969, caused a flood of fear in the Hollywood community. The sales of padlocks, guard dogs, and security systems skyrocketed overnight. In the press, theories abounded and many false leads would be widely publicized, further complicating the investigation process by police. The first suspect to be questioned would be the occupant of the guest house, William Garretson, who claimed he heard no screams or gunshots emanating from the main house that night. Sharon's husband, Roman Polanski, hurried home from his trip abroad and made an emotional statement to the press. The house is open now. The police has released it. And you can see, you can go and see the orgy place. You will see innumerable books about natural birth, which she was planning. And I was hurrying home because apparently I had to go to some kind of school with her. I never understood what it was, but I had to be present at these lessons or whatever it was. But I was going along with anything she said. Due to the confirmed drug use, and rumored decadence of victims Prakowski and Sebring, the tabloids had a field day speculating as to the true nature of the savage crimes. Sharon Tate, who on film had repeatedly portrayed the epitome of despoiled innocence, would now be remembered as a classic case of life imitating art. Her funeral was lavish and attended by a Hollywood who's who. As a fitting final tribute to her image as a pop goddess, Sharon was buried in a designer miniskirt. Meanwhile, little progress was being made by investigators, who initially dismissed the LaBianca murders as the work of a copycat killer. Actually, the homicides are not connected. Uh, I think the, the public and a lot of the media picked out the fact that they were similar in nature, possibly because of the, the blood and the inscriptions. But this is rather a common type of thing in homicides. We've had many cases before where uh, the suspect is written in blood or in lipstick or various things of that nature. Soon, Hollywood paranoia was so great that when the father of a popular singing quartet, the Lennon Sisters, was mysteriously murdered in an unrelated incident, screen magazines hurriedly dubbed the collective slayings the Tate-Lennon murders. It was during this period of wild speculation, only one week after the brutal slayings, that a remarkable coincidence would occur. A newspaper headline would, once again, ponder the popular question, who killed Sharon Tate? Unbeknownst to all, the answer was very near. In the next column, a smaller article reported the arrest of a gang of suspected auto thieves. Acting upon a series of complaints regarding the unkempt residents of Spawn Ranch, a massive police raid was executed, and the entire group rounded up and arrested. As would often be the case, Charles Manson was the last to be captured and booked. However, the whole affair was little more than an inconvenience to the group, who would be released within 48 hours due to an improper search procedure by police. With the authorities now routinely monitoring the Spawn Ranch activities, Manson decided the ranch had become too hot for comfort. He also knew that one of the traits that his suburban-born followers had found most intriguing was his insistence on remaining an essentially natural being. His regard for the ways of animals, his adherence to a vegetarian diet, and his non-dependence on plug-in luxuries were emulated by the group. Manson would now put their hearty pioneer spirits to the ultimate test and moved them to the hostile, barren environment of the Death Valley Desert. Previous to the planned exodus, Manson had secured permission to use an abandoned desert ranch from its owner, Arlene Barker, by trading a Beach Boys gold record that he had been given during his friendship with Dennis Wilson. The move from Spawn Ranch would not be without incident, however. A ranch hand, Donald Shorty Shea, who Manson was certain had initiated the police raid that ultimately made life intolerable in his macabre kingdom, mysteriously vanished. The journey to the sun-bleached sands of Barker Ranch was made caravan style, in a fleet of dune buggies and a school bus. The first days in the new setting were filled with adventure and wonderment, as Charlie and his troop would explore the desert terrain, observing its odd creatures and marveling at its mysteries. However, this field trip atmosphere would soon give way to the realities of blistering heat and dwindling provisions, and several of the girls would soon register disenchantment with the monotony of their new surroundings. In an effort to revitalize family morale, Manson would direct the group in what he perceived to be an act of eco-terrorism. The ritual burning of an unmanned earth-moving machine that belonged to the Death Valley Park Service. 
this endeavor would only serve to step up Manson's impending capture, as furious rangers now decided to investigate the reports of a strange band of desert-dwelling hippies in the area. Meanwhile, Manson found himself in a more desperate spot than ever. He sensed that several of the lesser members of his tribe were prepared to defect, carrying with them varying degrees of knowledge as to the murderous misdeeds of August 1969. When Manson resorted to issuing threats and frequent displays of tyrannical rage, several of the group escaped to a nearby town and told the sheriff of their leader's descent into cruelty and madness. Once again, a major raid took place with rangers and police rounding up the Barker Ranch gang. Manson was the last to be captured, having taken refuge in a tiny cabinet beneath the bathroom sink. When stolen vehicles were found on the property, the group was transferred to Indio County Jail for booking. During a routine interview there, Susan Atkins would display a perverse delight in tossing off cryptic references to the Tate murders. She was quickly transferred to Los Angeles, where she stunned authorities by happily recounting the details of the slayings in a nonchalant, breezy fashion. This news hit the national press like a bombshell and brought eventual murder charges against each of the Tate LaBianca slayers, as well as ringleader Charles Manson. Along with Manson, Susan Atkins, Patricia Krenwinkel, and Leslie Van Houten would be the first to stand trial for murder. At the time, the most bloodthirsty member of the group, Charles Watson, was being held in his native Texas and was initially spared prosecution by a lengthy extradition battle. Vincent Bugliosi, the chief prosecutor in the case, had found an ideal ally in Linda Kasabian. Kasabian, who had acted as a lookout on the night of the Tate slayings, was granted immunity in exchange for her testimony against her former associates. Bugliosi knew that in order to get a conviction for Manson, he would have to prove that he was the absolute architect and director of the tate LaBianca murders. He sought out several of the frightened and disillusioned ex-members of the group and interviewed each at length. From this vast pool of information, Bugliosi would construct for the jury a portrait of a paranoiac, antisocial tyrant who was intent on igniting a race war and believed the British music group, the Beatles, were sending him hidden messages through their music. Well, this was a uh, definition of Halter Skelter that, uh, that Charlie gave. Now, if you look at this white album, it's a Beatles album, there are many other songs. One of them is called Sexy Sadie. Sadie, At or Sadie Glutz, also known as Susan Atkins, whatever you want to call her, she thought that the Beatles named this song after her. There's also a song called Piggies. There's also a song... in the Helder Skelter song? Nothing particularly in that song right there, except the definition that Manson gave of it. There's another song in that same album called Blackbirds, talking about blackbirds fixing their wings and rising up. Charles Manson said the blackbird uh, meant the black man. Various elements of the public reacted differently to the strange tales that were abounding. For the hippies, the nonviolent purveyors of peace and love, every dismal revelation of the trial would sound a distinct death knell for their movement. Ironically, mainstream America was just beginning to lay aside many of its misgivings about the flower children. For years, hippies had been depicted by film and television as a comical and thoroughly harmless entity. However, the infamous cover of Life magazine, coupled with the sensational daily accounts of drug use and murder, would send a collective chill through the suburbs of America, and suddenly hippies weren't cute anymore. Manson was now viewed by the hippie movement as the guy who spoiled the party. On the other hand, young extremists and radicals